So the external ear is called the oracle or penta. It's made of uh, ridges of cartilage that are designed to funnel uh, auditory sounds into the hole in the ear, which is the external auditory meatus. So the outer cartilage ring is referred to as the helix. The inner ring is referred to as the anti-helix. We also then have two cartilage pads, one in front of the ear and one at the bottom of the anti-helix that are called the tragus, anterior to the ear, and the anti-tragus, posterior to that. The bottom of the ear lacks cartilage and it's called the lobule. We have depressions created by these ridges of cartilage. So you'll notice that the anti-helix Ys at the top. So the depression between the wide part of it is the triangular cartilage because of its triangular shape. The really large depression in the ear is the concha. And the concha is what's responsible for funneling sound waves down into the external auditory meatus here. And so the concha gets its name because it's whirled like a conch or a snail. So as you recall from the skull, we had three little bones in our ear we call the inner ear ossicles. And they're located in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And in order, they would be the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And what they do is they allow vibrational sound to be communicated from the tympanic membrane through the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So this is our external auditory meatus, and sound waves travel down that and then hit the tympanic membrane, which is the membrane that we're seeing right here. And then attached to that would be the malleus back in this chamber, and then the incus, and then the stapes in order. So what they do is they communicate vibrational sound uh, through the inner, uh, the middle ear space, and are eventually going to communicate it to a structure in the inner ear, which is called the trochlea. So because we have uh, an airspace on each side of the tympanic membrane, then we have to be able to equalize pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane. So we actually have a tube that runs from our nasal pharynx here up into this middle ear space. And so it's frequently called the eustachian tube or the auditory tube. And it, there's a little cartilage ring at the bottom here, uh, elastic ring that closes and opens that uh, so that you can equalize pressure between these two spaces. To control the, the vibrations of the tympanic membrane, we have a muscle that we can see here, uh, which sets posterior to the eustachian tube, which is the tensor tympani muscle and it attaches to the malleus and controls uh, vibrations of the uh, tympanic membrane. So the inner ear uh, consists of this structure. The coiled part of the inner ear is called the cochlea and it's going to be involved in auditory sensations. The head of the snail-like structure here is called the vestibule and it's going to be involved in uh, dynamic and static equilibrium. And then the three semicircular canals here are all involved in dynamic equilibrium. So if we look at the head, there's actually a oval shaped structure here, which is called the oval window. And that's what the stapes has to fit in. And so the stapes is gonna vibrate in and out of this hole and actually create pressure waves inside of our trochlea here. So if we find the, the oval window, if we rotate it downward a little bit, we'll see a smaller window that's perfectly round. So its name is the round window. And so when the stapes pushes in the oval window, the membrane of the round window gets pushed out so that you can dissipate the force of the waves. Now when we open the cochlea up, we'll be able to see that the cochlea is constructed uh, in a way in which there's bone on the outside, there's a space, and then there's this membrane structure, the pink structure on the inside. So the pink structure on the inside is called the cochlear duct, and it has a space inside of it that we're going to look at in a minute. So the way we think of all of this apparatus of the ear is it's surrounded by bone, 
And so the bone is called the bony labyrinth. The space inside of that would be filled with a, a liquid we call perilymph. And then the cochlear duct is surrounded by membranes, so we'd call that the membranous labyrinth. And the space we're going to see inside of that is going to be uh, filled with a different liquid called endolymph. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a model that is a section through this cochlear duct. So this, what we were just talking about now we see in cross section. So this is bone going around the outside here. So this represents the bony labyrinth. And we have these two spaces that we would find associated with the bony labyrinth in the cochlea. And so they would be filled with perilymph. And this space has got a membrane that defines its upper uh, surface and a membrane that defines its lower surface. So it's essentially surrounded by membranes. So this is a cochlear duct, or what we would call the membranous labyrinth, and it would be filled with endolymph. So we end up with perilymph, endolymph, and perilymph. So the reference for those words is a cochlear duct. If it's inside the cochlear duct, it's endo. If it's around the cochlear duct, it's peri. So using the prefixes the way we've used them uh, in, in a couple of other areas that we've talked about. So we have names for these large chambers that are part of the bony labyrinth. And the, the name, what you have to look at is this membrane right here. So this membrane is called the vestibular membrane. So this large space associated with this membrane is called the scala vestibuli. And the, the oval window that we were just looking at opens to the scala vestibuli. The space below it is called the scala tympani, and it gets its name because the opening to this is the oval window, excuse me, the round window, and the round window opens back into the tympanic space where the tympanic membrane was. So scala vestibuli, scala tympani. So the cochlear duct here has the organ of corti on it. And the organ of corti is what's going to eventually convert mechanical sound into electric impulses. And so if we look at the organ of corti, we have uh, hair, hair cells, which are actually cells with cilia. And we have uh, an inner hair cell row that's this single cell by itself that runs in a long row. And then we have three hair cells that are the outer hair cells that all run in rows of three, the length of this duct. And we have a membrane over it called the tectoral membrane. And the membrane in which the organ of corti sets is called the basilar membrane. So this is the basilar membrane, this is the tectoral membrane, and this is the vestibular membrane. So the membrane's associated with the cochlear duct. Now the way the ear is going to work is the stapes is going to create waves in perilymph in the scale of vestibuli. The waves in the scale of vestibuli are going to cause this membrane to vibrate back and forth. And that's going to create waves in the perilymph, which is going to cause the basilar membrane to move up and down. So as the basilar membrane is moved up, it bends these hairs against the tectoral membrane. And it's the bending of hairs against the tectoral membrane that elicit a action potential that is eventually sent on to the brain for interpretation. And the organ of corti, so the organ of corti is inside of this cochlear duct that's all coiled here, and that's what we were looking at over here. So what happens is there are these, these cells have long rows of cells that are in this cochlear duct. And so they respond to different frequencies at different points along this route so that we can interpret different frequencies of sound based upon where the hair cells are in this particular apparatus. And so with the human ear, we have sounds that are too low or deep for us to hear, and then we have sounds that are too high uh, for us to hear in terms of frequencies. So a good example would be a dog whistle that 
dogs can hear that we can't hear. And so we have a range of hearing based upon where the hair cells are located along this cochlear duct. So clinically, if someone is exposed to loud sounds in certain frequencies, the hair cells can get damaged and you can actually lose your hearing in that particular frequency range because the hair cells were damaged in a particular area on the cochlear duct. So, so now we've been talking about the cochlea, which is auditory. So now we're going to change our attention to the vestibule and to these semicircular canals, which are involved in equilibrium and our relative uh, interpretation of gravity on Earth. And so within the vestibule, the head-like area, we actually have two sensory apparatus that we can see depicted here as these two gray areas. And one is called the utrica, and the other is called the saccule. And these both respond to gravitational pull. Uh, if we cut these open, and I don't have a good model for this, so there are pictures in your PowerPoints that, that do that. If we cut this open, what we would see is we'd have a membrane uh, called the basilar membrane in here. We'd have a gelatinous mass sitting on that membrane called the otolithic membrane. And then we would have little calcium carbonate crystals embedded in the otolithic membrane that we call otoliths. And otoliths literally translate to uh, rocks, ear rocks. And so what we know is that rocks are drawn toward gravity. And so when we move our head, this changes its relative location, and then gravity pulls on the otoliths, and that stretches the otolithic membrane and bends hair cells again so that we are, have an interpretation of gravity. Now, the semicircular canals are involved in dynamic equilibrium. And so this would sit in a person uh, similar to this. So we actually have three semicircular canals on three different planes. So we have an anterior semicircular canal, a posterior semicircular canal, and a lateral semicircular canal. The anterior semicircular canal actually uh, is involved in acceleration and deceleration, or front flips and back flips that we would be doing. The, the, this lateral semicircular canal is rotational, and whether you know you're rotating to the left or right or counterclockwise and clockwise. And then the back semicircular canal is for lateral movement, such as cartwheels, if we were doing cartwheels from side to side. So the way they work is at the, at the end of each semicircular canal, we have a swollen area that we call an ampulla. And so we can see the ampulla right here. Now, if we look inside the ampulla, we're actually going to have a swollen gray area again. And so the gray area is our uh, membranous labyrinth. The white area is the bony labyrinth. So we have, between the white and the gray, we would have perilymph. Inside the gray, we have endolymph. In this, in this swollen area, we have a sensory apparatus that's called a crista. And a crista, again, has a basilar membrane in which hair cells set. And then it has a cup-shaped uh, gelatinous mass that covers the hairs called the cupule. And what happens is when we move, the endolymph inside of here begins to move. And then the endolymph bends the cupula, and that causes a bending of the hair cells. So based upon their orientation in the body, then you know whether you're moving forward, moving backwards with this one. You know whether you're doing rotations left and right with this one. And you know whether you're doing uh, lateral movement to the side with this one. And so each one has its own ampulla. Each one has its own uh, crista inside. And the movement of endolymph inside these rings then bends hair cells and that allows us to interpret uh, movement.